The blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. Hail to the king, baby. Officials are quoted as explaining that since the brain of a ghoul has been activated by the radiation, boy, the plan is kill the brain, groovy, and you kill the ghoul. Welcome to hell. I said I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. <laughs> Welcome to prime time! <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to the podcast in the back seat. I almost forgot that already. Um, I'm one of your humble hosts, Matthew. And I have today with me, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm Wayne. Uh, it's delighted to be here with you, Matthew. Just uh, as we sit and discuss the, the ins and outs uh, and our views on, on horror... Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, well, this is going to be our the the one stop shop that you you always need to go to for anything horror, um, mostly movies because we want to. But anyway, <laughs> we had a couple of topics actually planned though, didn't we? Because originally it was going to be the idea was that we're going to have it's a movie review show, but who are we? Why why would you want to listen to our? Reviews, who you, you know, who are these sexy sons of bees <laughs> telling you what to watch? It. I, I, I think initially, whenever you and I discussed doing the podcast, it was a whole idea that would come from a, from a place of love, uh, and rather than sort of reviewing or critiquing movies, I think we would just probably just end up picking movies that we we love and really really enjoy, um, and we don't want to be detrimental or negative towards any kind of horror movie because movies are so. So difficult to get made, uh, you know that we don't want to sit and dog anybody for 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 even trying. Who's who've done considerably more than what we have whenever it comes to to making movies, etc. They've managed to make the thing, which is phenomenal. Uh, but we would choose rather not to be negative towards that movie and just just stick to to a place of love. Oh, I absolutely agree, and I think it's important. And there's there's so many podcasts out there just to get this out of the way, so you know what we're all about, I guess. There's so many negative reviews out there. You've got the angry gamers, all that sort of thing, and they're kind of funny, but they they get really stale. So, what do you? Where do you go from there? You, oh, I, I'm not going to play that game because this this angry fat person on the internet told me not to. Well, what what do you watch? What do you see? Well, we'll tell you. We'll we'll give you our honest opinion about films. And as uh, my co-host Wayne even said, there, who are we? We've not made films. Like, <laughs> we're just a couple of fans. <laughs> And I think that's that's what we wanted to do. Is just trying to make it sort of enjoyable to, and talk about what we enjoy. Uh, we, we do have varying opinions and, and genres in which we kind of lean on, and sort of and how we got uh, introduced to, to to the world of horror. So, which it should be, hopefully, fingers crossed, it should be a lot of fun between the two of us because uh, I enjoy sitting talking to Matthew about movies uh, at great length any time of the day. We just thought we would record it and just see what happens. Um, so, speaking of. Uh, I think one of the, the, the questions or one of the topics we wanted to discuss was sort of uh, what was your earliest memory whenever it came to horror? Yeah, um, that's that's a good point actually as well. I did I made some notes on this because I actually had to ask my dad um, because my earliest memory of horror goes very far back. It's actually at the the ripe old age of under one. Um, <laughs> My dad, well, my parents, both of them, um, would actually play the movie Halloween because a- apparently the-, the theme just soothed me to sleep. <laughs> and I grew up all right, clearly. But yeah, no, I, I, would, I would watch Halloween uh, to go to sleep. And then I actually remember the time when I first watched Halloween and understood actually what was going on in, on the screen, that this was actually a horrific thing that's happening to these people if it was real. Um, I must have been about seven, to be honest with you. Um, but there was a, a very important part that he mentioned when I was talking to my dad about it was that um, I was never, and th- this is a topic we're going to touch on a little bit later as well, but I was never like terrified of it because he would always say, if it does scare you, the stop button on the VHS, yes, I'm that old, is right there. And knowing that was enough for me to just enjoy it. Um, but I would like to put the, the same question to yourself. So. <laughs> I think my earliest memory of horror was um, 
because they weren't particularly horrific as such, but they used to put them on sort of um, not particularly late on at night, but you would have movies like uh, The Hammer Horror, Christopher Lee as uh, Dracula, Prince of Darkness, uh, and that that vision of Dracula, and I think it's Van Helsing on the ice, always stuck with me. So, you know, with this charismatic, slick-backed-haired gentleman uh, with a twinkle in his eye was, was, you know, putting these lovely ladies, in quotation marks, to sleep by kissing their neck. Uh, and that's that's what got me into it. It was that kind of that vision or that image of, of um, Christopher Lee and that hammer horror. Um, and, yeah, it's just something that I loved. And it was sort of another part of it as well because... My family probably would say that wasn't really horror as such, but I, I would I would disagree with them. Um, for how sort of earliest memory of horror was was not being allowed to watch horror movies. You know, you're not allowed to watch that movie. You're not allowed to watch The Exorcist. You're not allowed to watch Halloween. Uh, you're not allowed to watch Nightmare on Elm Street. You're not allowed to watch Chucky, or as I found it was called Child's Play. It was forbidden. So because of that, I, w- I wanted to watch it more and more. So that's that's kind of. Um, my earliest memory of horror is being told, "Don't do it. Don't don't watch the horror film. It'll scare you. It'll give you nightmares." And I'm just all the more wanted to watch it as a result of being told that it's it's not allowed. That's interesting, that though, because when when you consider that as well as because I imagine that happens for a lot of people, you're told you shouldn't be watching this. There's an 18 rating on it for a good reason. Mm-hmm. The, the, I imagine for because obviously I was you know oh here's Halloween an 18 rated film before I was one like an idiot. Um, I imagine for most people that that is, it's a sort of taboo. It's like don't don't smoke, so everyone thinks, well, why I want to try it, or don't watch this, it's a horror. Well, why I want to see why? About <laughs> um, how how horrific how horrific can it be? You know, am I am I up to the task to be able to sit and watch it and enjoy it, or am I going to be genuinely scared? And I think that's quite it's 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 a bit of a strange one because for me, I was able to watch any action film, I was able to watch any movie with any rating. But the second it was a horror in those sort of ten movies that I wasn't allowed, you know, that you know that was a no go. But basically anything else, I could sit and watch Arnold Schwarzenegger killing hundreds of people, or Sly Stallone, or uh, Jean Claude Van Damme kicking the seven colours out of somebody, <laughs> and that was that was just that was fine. And there would be sex scenes and stuff like that in the movie, and that was okay. <laughs> yeah. That was just two people cuddling each other, <laughs> but but whenever it came to horror, that was it wasn't allowed. So I just wanted to watch it more and more. So uh, that's a good point, that, actually. Yeah, you, you do actually bring up a good point there. With action movies have technically infinitely more death in it, but for some mm-hmm. reason it, it's just a lot more personal, isn't it? With the likes of horror, like you you actually see. I don't know. Some action films can be a bit personal as well. Like, I mm-hmm. suppose. but that, that's interesting. It's it's how polar opposite we are. Like, my parents were like, "Oh, watch this, you loony," and you are like, "No, be careful." <laughs> I, I think for me personally, I think um, where I'm from, if if, if the, the listeners can hear, is I'm, I'm from Northern Ireland. So generally, a lot of movies that I wasn't allowed to watch had religious, religious implications. Not that my family was particularly religious at all. It was just a case of that was that was a no go. So certain things that weren't allowed, say maybe say resurrection. So we've got Pet Cemetery, The Exorcist, which involves demonic possession. Um, I'm trying to think of any other ones where it was basically no, that's not allowed. Oh, with uh, the, with the so, likes of the Omen. Uh, again, another one that wasn't allowed uh-huh. uh, because possibly because of the religious implications. But then there's. And then I wanted to watch it more with me not being a, a religious person. You know, I just wanted to watch it to see as to what it was all about. Why was it so taboo? Why was it such a, a banned movie and didn't get released for like 25, 30 years afterwards? Yeah. When they started broadcasting it on Sky with the director's cut and a few other different versions of it. Like, I, I, you know, looking back at it now, it's pretty sort of tame. But I can see as to why, whatever it initially came out, why it was so... So forbidden for people yeah, yeah. to the point of where people would have to get in buses and organise almost like by a travel agent to go to a cinema that was willing to show this movie. You would have to maybe drive out of county or maybe drive to another country to be able to go and see this movie. And I would love to have been around for that. That would oh, have been great. Could you imagine now? That would be the best thing in the world. <laughs> oh, you don't, I'm, you don't I'm, get that I'm, feeling anymore, do you? Like, <laughs> um. 
possibly not. Um, which, which I think is a shame, but I think maybe it's because maybe maybe people are a little bit more accepting and just realise that it's 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 a work of fiction. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's something we've touched on beforehand that anything that happens within the realms of fiction will will never kind of touch on on the horrific things that we kind of do to each other. You know that the, you know they're way worse than any horror film anybody can concoct. Yeah. Not to try and go down any kind of serious route. This is obviously trying to be <laughs> silly and everything else, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's sort of not tame. It's just people are more accepting of it, which is good. It's more of a trope that people are, are willing to accept and, and lean into, which is why there's so many horror movies out there for people to enjoy and digest and, and pass on to friends. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you, you've touched upon a good point there as well. Um, personally speaking, I can watch any horror. It doesn't really matter to me. and mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with it. And again, we're going to touch upon a couple of things in terms of fear later on. But mm-hmm. you show me a true crime thing, and I'm I'm cockily as out. I can't. <laughs> um, you've you've mentioned where you're from uh, with with the words like cockily and out. Uh, I'm a Geordie uh, from the north of England. If you haven't worked that out, so that'll be why you hear nonsense from me. But um, I just I can't get into it. I don't. A lot of people like these sort of true crime, and I'm not going to criticise them for it. That's fine. It's just not for me. We're, we're keeping this fun, and I, I, because I like fun. <laughs> But yeah, that is. It's it's one of those things that, that that's real. That's exactly. that's 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 true. Uh, quotation marks again. That's true horror because that's something that has really happened. That's not a movie. That's not somebody putting pen to paper in order to to yeah. create a story in order to draw people in. That's something that has genuinely happened. And I I, I would agree with you. Yeah. I find it more unnerving. That's not to say I won't continue to watch it. Uh, prior to us recording this, I, I watched so I Am the Killer, um, and that is. That is difficult to watch in some points yeah. because you know what what happens to people prior to them committing these particular these particular crimes is is sort of it's not ex- it was expected you know what yeah. why can you not expect it to happen? Um, it's, it's uncomfortable. But yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. But I think that's what people want. They, they yeah. want that uncomfortable. They want to be better informed. Um, and I think horror does that in a particular way because uh, something we mentioned beforehand and we'll hopefully do a later date is sort of. Horror based on on true events or inspired by true events. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that leads into a really a nice segue into the next question that we had as well. Actually, when you think about it, because uh-huh. for me that, that the only time I feel true fear, and uh, you can see where we're going with this, <laughs> is when real things happen. So when you were a child, we were we, one of the questions we had was when you were growing up or when you first got introduced to horror. What's which film specifically scared you the most, and why? Uh, the, the first one, which is it's 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 possibly gonna throw people off. The first movie that like truly scared me as a kid was Edward Scissorhands. Nice. Uh, and I know a lot of people will say it is a horror movie because it's about a monster, and people's misunderstanding in the same way that there was a misunderstanding of say Frankenstein's monster, etc. Um, but yeah, Edward Scissorhands scared me. Like I thought that he was doubly more terrifying than uh, Freddy Krueger because Freddy Krueger's only got one hand. It's sure. Edward Scissorhands has got two. He's got no skin below the neck. He's a, he's a he's a for want of a better word a man made um, machine or monster or or, or, or person uh, who could do twice as much damage as as uh, Freddy Krueger. Um, and that scene where he's on the waterbed yeah. and he starts accidentally stabbing it and the, the the water's flying all over the place. I find that terrifying. It's just emotionless, expressionless, dead behind the eyes like a shark. Mm-hmm. Character <laughs> really scared me. Um, I was going to say, like, Johnny we... Depp's. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt a little bit there. No, no, go ahead. That's fine. Johnny Depp's performance there as well. He, he did the way he carries himself. It is actually creepy as heck. How do you think about it? Hey, like, mm-hmm. and I never really thought about this until you've you've literally mentioned there. Um, Edward Scissorhands is double the the danger of Freddy. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, Johnny Depp was in the original Nightmare as well. So that's a. I'd never noticed that before. Go on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, brings me to a little um, factoid um, that I found out that Jackie Earl Haley drove Johnny Depp to the. Um, no, Johnny Depp drove Jackie Earl Haley to do the. Um, what's it called? The interview. What's what's the term for it when they do the audition? Oh yeah. So Jackie Earl Haley was uh, driven by Johnny Depp to do the audition for Nightmare on Elm Street, and then they saw this. Beautiful, 
porcelain skinned gentleman and decided, all right, we want we want the good looking guy rather than Jackie Earl Haley. And then fast forward so many years later, he obviously um, appears as Freddy Krueger in the remake, which came out must be over a decade ago now. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was. Uh, it, I thought that was really really interesting that he drove him to do it, and then he ended up uh, getting the part instead. Um, I mean, a little segue there as well. That's another film that I think gets criticism, but his performance is amazing. Now, nobody's Robert England, and no. what I liked about that was he didn't play it as Robert England. Perfect. Do that. <laughs> That's okay with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's the point in, in making the movie if you're not going to try and put your own spin it? Otherwise, it's just imitation rather than you performing it to copy rather than anything else. And I think what I think, and I really liked what they tried to do with it, is just to go very straight-laced with it and just make it very straight-up horror, whereas if you look back um, to A Nightmare on Elm Street, it's, it's very sort of, with the big long arms and everything else and his mannerisms and everything else, it's, it's sort of, he's quite funny and charismatic, and that's what's sort of, what's a bit dangerous about him and maybe yeah. why later movies, you wanted to see him yeah. killing teenagers, you wanted him to torture people. He and became your anti-hero. Yeah. Yeah. You're, it's I think as you get older, you start rooting more for the killer rather than for the teens because you're so divorced or diso- disassociated from from that sort of age group rather than you putting yourself in the in the shoes of the of the helpless teen or the, or the damsel. You're <laughs> you're the person that you're going. Yeah, those kids are annoying. I'd, I'd kill. Them. I'd straight up kill them as well. So the death becomes um, cathartic. You're like, yeah, get rid of them. <laughs> Get rid- oh yeah, that is annoying. Yeah, they definitely shouldn't be doing drugs. Yeah. They shouldn't be uh, doing stuff that I wasn't in at that age group doing. So I, I'm jealous of them. So go ahead, Freddy. Go ahead, Jason. Go ahead, Michael. Kill them, <laughs> please. Please do it for me because I can't. In a way, yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> Uh, the other one as well for as me as a child was was Freddy Krueger. That was the one that was forbidden. You don't watch Freddy Krueger. Uh, so whenever Wes Craven's a new nightmare, uh, which is revolutionary in, in my opinion, very very clever, yeah. uh, very meta as well because it's sort of very self aware. I watched that one and then couldn't sleep for like two weeks. And my mum took one look at me um, and said, "You watched Freddy Krueger, didn't you?" And I went. Yeah, Mama did. Uh, oh. Freddy Krueger. I'm really sorry, <laughs> but I couldn't sleep for two weeks, and that stuck with me. And that's it's it's that's how powerful the the imagery that comes comes with it. And I think yeah. possibly I watched them out of order. So I watched a new nightmare before I watched any of the other Freddy Krueger movies, nice. um, which made it sort of maybe all the more real because it's it's aware that Freddy Krueger was in the movies and now he's become real. Yeah. So why why can't that happen to me as a, a preteen? <laughs> get terrified by Freddy Krueger so it was it was amazing so yeah Freddy Krueger was forbidden so obviously I wanted to watch that so that was terrifying it gets you in your dreams yeah. you know the bit where you're you're most vulnerable and you're asleep whenever you're you know you're out Honestly, and nobody's there to protect you such an amazing idea for a, a villain like nothing like since has come close when are you more vulnerable than when you're asleep you're not <laughs> I love Wes Craven but my god he, he stole the best idea <laughs> for I know. ages <laughs> Oh. Uh, and then the last one was, was Chucky. Nice. Just the whole idea of a toy in your room becoming sentient and deciding it's gonna it's gonna kill you. It's a genius idea. It obviously goes with the whole Jack in the Box music and all that sort of twinkly toy music. You know, you're surrounded as a kid in a room with toys, and then one of them decides it's gonna gonna start killing you with it with the uh, the dulcet tones of Brad Dourif, yeah, uh, who just breathes life into a good guy doll. You know, it turns something so so innocent into something so sinister, and I think that's 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 beautiful, but also terrifying. Yeah, um, definitely. So the, those those are the three for me that were were terrifying as a kid, and then everything else was kind of like, not that it was a lie, it was just it was just silly. Yeah, yeah. What about yourself? What was what was sort of the the one that scared you as a child? Yeah, um, well, it was funny when you mentioned Freddy's new nightmare, uh, Wes Craven's new nightmare. Sorry. I remember seeing that as a kid because, again, I'm older. I remember it coming out almost, almost, because I was young. The The difference there was, obviously, I was a big Freddy fan prior because I'd seen Nightmare and things like that. My dad, mm-hmm. I'm going to mention my dad a lot because I think he's <laughs> the one that influenced me quite a bit. And I wish I still had it. We had the, it was a cinema poster for the film. 
So in his glory, what he did was he put that above my bed. <laughs> so I used to sleep under, and oh, I don't know if you remember the, the actual posters for it. It was Freddy coming out of the clouds, reaching down. Now this poster, it had, it was a big oblong poster, but his claws came out from under a little bit. So there was like little points where they were, but they were circular. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I'll, when you when you mentioned that that reminded me of a nightmare I had, but <laughs> it's not a film that scared me. But that poster certainly did. Uh, waking up with freaking Cr- Freddy Krueger literally reaching down towards me. Um, but to be honest, again, I, I got I got um, subject to ho- uh, well horror at a very early age. There, there was only really one that sprang to mind when I asked my parents again because I was I was really struggling to try and think of one. I knew there would have been a few. And there was a few <laughs> things when you mentioned there, like some of the Exorcist, things like that. I could watch them, but it was never something they would out their way put on. So it, it, that was sl- still slightly taboo, I think, because of obviously some of the things, that, like the themes that happened in it as well, mostly to do with how Reagan um, reacted to the cross. But <laughs> the film that, the, the one film that I, I distinctly remember actually scaring me was, and you're going to laugh a little bit, is American Werewolf in London. Okay. So after all these slashes, all these, these you know, Freddy Krueger and all that, it was American Werewolf in London. And the scene that specifically got me was the bit where he's, the transformation scene. Mm-hmm. So that amazing transformation throughout all of it. I remember the first time watching it even, and I, I must have been about seven year old, this pudgy little kid looking at it this hand growing on screen which looked so real and so cool and thinking that's amazing and then all of a sudden when he's lying there he looks towards the camera and reaches out that scene was the bit I couldn't that I, I lost I, I had to leave the room <laughs> all of a sudden the, this villain so Michael Myers was in, in other films just walking around doing his business he never looked at you he never reached for you that for some reason mm-hmm. that gave me nightmares. So that's that's the one it, and only time. I was because that that was going to yeah you've answered my question. It's the whole idea as to what what particularly you know yeah. terrified you, but it's the whole idea that it it, it draws you in. Uh, and for a lot of movies, the you know the directors and stuff don't look at the camera. Yeah. And there's very few instances where where the, the person the 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 protagonist or the antagonist looks directly down the lens of the camera that just sort of draws you in I'll be um, honest, it, it's a it's a taboo to do actually and, and if you watch a film mm-hmm. and somebody does look at the camera it's a mistake or if they do it and and, and it's not a mistake like sort of like deadpool it kind of does it because of his character and it's not a horror but that, that's the sort of meta thing he does um but in horror especially if something looks at the camera that's a mistake and it shouldn't be there mm-hmm. in american wealth in london it's done so well and so intentionally for some reason, I can still picture it now. It's like, I can't. Oh my god! But I, I love it now. Like I do watch it now, and it doesn't scare me now, as far as I want to admit. <laughs> I was I was just struggling to to remember as to what the name of the um the the name of the guy that did the um the special effects is it Rick Baker? That sounds right because it's the fellow who did um, Thriller, wasn't it? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Um, yes, it was. It was Rick Baker. Yeah. Who, unfortunately, a few years back retired from doing special effects, but he does the makeup for his daughter for Halloween every year, and it is it's still better than than most movies that are currently in production. And it's just something beautiful. And we'll probably talk about it at a, at a later date about the the timelessness of, of practical effects oh, and how it yeah. ages so much better. But the the one for Rick Baker, I remember watching a documentary or it was um, additional scene. Um, where they talked uh, behind the scenes about how they made an American werewolf in London. And one of the bits was most horror films where there's a transformation, say for werewolves, say maybe The Howling or The Thing. Is it obviously, I know both you and I love that movie very, very much. Yeah. Um, the, it always happens in darkness. Yeah. With a load of petroleum jelly or KY jelly and, you know, shadows and misdirection and everything else. And it's very, very clever. But I know John Landis basically told Rick Baker. I'm going to give you a perfectly lit set because I want everybody to see what you're able to, to achieve in a bright lit set, which which is phenomenal. And I think it was a first at the time. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give you a brightly lit room, which makes it possibly more terrifying because you can see everything that is going on. Yeah. The transfer change and the the, the pain on on the um, the character's face and everything else. It's just it's just phenomenal, and I think- it's, it's it's timeless. I think as well. 
oh, hundred percent. It looks great now. But when mm-hmm. when you um what you mentioned there, that's another interesting point as well. Now transformations for people, they look like and if you watch earlier werewolf films, especially or, or other things like like that, when people are transforming, they look like almost oh that's annoying. I'm tr- oh god, I've got a hairy hand now. Like they're in slight pain. American Wealth made it look agonizing. Like his bones mm-hmm. are cracking, and that, that's the first time that was done properly, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And it, like mm-hmm. you say, because you can see it as well. Um, so I think the tension was just ramping up and up. You can see this, and then all of a sudden he looks at you, and I, I poop my pants, is, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah it, was, um, it was amazing, because that then led to uh, John Landis, I think he directed and made the Thriller music video for Michael Jackson. Yeah. Um, because Michael Jackson was such a huge fan of, of that particular genre horror, that particular aesthetic that he achieved with it. And it's just, it's brilliant. Yeah. It, it sort of walks that very clever line between um, comedy and horror. Because yeah. there's little bits of very British dark sense of humour with Jenny Agutter, uh Andrew McNaughton. Is yeah. the name of the guy, I believe, that plays the main character. And then the very sort of dry sense of humour with his zombie friend in the cinema, where he's oh, talking he's, to him and throughout the course of the movie... He's amazing. ...becomes more... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he's so... He just talks about it, the fact that he's been mad, uh, murdered, a matter of fact. Um, but uh, yeah, very, very clever, very well done. And uh, Plus, I think it stands uh, up really, really well. If you, It might be one of those things that the audience might want to go back and watch as well, but you, you probably remember... It didn't reduce Rick Mail as well. That was his very first role, and I'm a huge fan of Rick, Rick Mail as well. I actually got to meet him at one point, and sadly didn't have my American Wealth in London with me, so he signed me uh, his book instead. But all he says is "Remember the Alamo," so check that out uh, if you haven't seen it. Uh, who's that I'll guy? Is it is it Brian Glover? Brian? No. Who's um? Oh God, the guy out of Alien Three, but he's also the one who's in the bar. Yeah, you're right. It's Brian, Brian Glover. Oh, okay. uh, Sheffield, a uh, northern lad. Uh, but yes, he's he's in it because he's the one that says not to go across the moors. Yeah. Uh, in the in the slaughtered lamb. But yes, that's it. I I, I, I get who you're talking about now. He's such uh, yeah, an he's... underrated actor, though. Like because in that that whole that pub scene at the beginning. So we have jumped in a tangent a little bit, but <laughs> that's, that's I, I just love the American Wealth in London for me and my partner. Right, loves werewolf films and. God bless her. She introduced me to uh, Dog Soldiers, which is a great movie. Mm-hmm. But I maintain the best werewolf horror movie is still American Werewolf in London. It's just the performance, as you say, comedy mm-hmm. elements mixed in with uh, the horror. And just for Jack, obviously, as well, is is a sidekick, which is he's hilarious. The, the whole bit in the um, the theatre at the end as well, where they're, they're jauntily telling him how he should kill himself. It's like, whoa. <laughs> Should I laugh? And that you, I think it's <laughs> yeah. it's one of those things that sort of, for from my understanding, uh, I worked in America for for a period of time, and, and sort of it would just stem to a lot of sort of British um, humour, which is very dark, um, which I would I would agree very much sort of like you know not to try and be too broad and, and sort of everything else. I think we, uh, you know, British horror is very very dark, and you know it's it's a way of making sense of something terrible that's happened is to make a joke about it. And I think that introduced Americans to that and it walks that fine line of being able to do um, appeal to an American audience, in my opinion, and also appeal to British people. Yeah, of course, yeah, you wouldn't cut across the moors. Yeah. Of course, you're going to get attacked. Something terrible is going to happen to you in the darkness. But also, later on, obviously, as you mentioned, about uh, him very flippantly mentioned about how he should kill himself. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how else are you supposed to do that? You know, that, that sort of put next to somebody who's a, a walking zombie solely in the mind of a man who's a werewolf and transforms in a full moon. You know, well, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous though. it has to be funny, yeah? Yeah, like, because you, you think if, if they were to go dark with it and have him in a dark room and be like, you should kill yourself in this dramatic music, it would be like every other film like that and you'd be like, oh, well, okay, whatever, he's going to maybe... But the fact they've made it a joke, you, you're laughing and then you realise you're laughing and go, oh... That's not funny. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> uh, I, f- I forgot his name. Um, <laughs> Kessler, something Kessler. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the phenomenal film. Really, really sort of clever and everything else. It, it manages to walk that very fine line between yeah. between comedy and horror, which is something we could we could do later on because there's so many examples um, 
of comedy slash horror, where they walk that fine line between the two, which is really, really good. Like, without um, tipping over into parody, there's, as you say, there's so many good ones that use comedy as a horror tool, and that's important mm-hmm. as well, I think. But yeah, no, sorry, you were saying. No, no, that's, that's, that's you, you raised a good point, which is the whole idea that um, you can't sustain that that horror the whole way through, that, that level of tension or anxiety or suspension the whole way through the movie. You have to cut that with, with comic relief, which then makes it all the more horrific when then something then ramps back up. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's it is. A, it, I would agree entirely that the you know comedy is is a horror tool, um, and you have to do it so well. It has to be timed well. It has to be you know, the right phrasing and everything else in order to um, make the sca- the horror more scary. Yeah. It's like it's like the Jaws where he, he tells him that he's gonna you know why don't you try chumping this and then he throws it over his shoulder. Obviously, it's a throwaway remark, and he, he's, he's trying to give his his boss, for want of a better word, to Quint Robert Shaw. Um, throwing some shade and all of a sudden <laughs> the jaws pops out you know jaws pops out of the water and you just go on like, ah. it, it's you the probably... first look of the shark there's no fanfare like properly anyway it's mm-hmm. in broad daylight and he just comes out and that that as you say the comedy aspect of it didn't prepare you for that shock it's amazing mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so good oh but otherwise you wouldn't have been disarmed in the way that you were whenever that particular scene happens, which is it's phenomenal. It's, it's, it's something, like you said, I've never thought too much about it, but it's very, very clever that it's got comedic aspects to it because otherwise it wouldn't be, wouldn't be as scary. And he ramps it back uh, down with, the, with his reaction because he's an amazing actor as well. He backs into it and says, uh, now this gets misquoted, and I don't want to misquote it, but he says, we're going to get a bigger boat, right? Not, we need a bigger boat. I'll say the way around. I can't remember. I think it's you're going to need a bigger boat. Ah, oh, damn! I knew I'd get it wrong. <laughs> it's it's right up there with um, "Look, I'm your father" or whatever. It's 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 one of those misquoted ones. It, yeah. He doesn't actually state it that way. <laughs> um, so search your feelings. You know it to be true. Um, but yeah, that's that's one of those things that um, yeah, you're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> and then it gets it gets ripped off, and it's to the point where it's almost parody or farce that it just gets thrown in for whatever for whatever reason. <laughs> Um, thinking about so we, we've talked about what's what scared us as kind of as kids, um, like you said, a nightmare. Uh, sorry, not nightmare. Um, American Werewolf in London. Anything else particularly scary aside from American Werewolf in London? That was honestly the the only example that I got from my folks. Apparently, I could sit and watch watch anything else. Um, the the next time I remember, and I was still quite young, ever being frightened was watching it, it was a Japanese horror film. Um. Uh, oh, it was a tale of two sisters, I think it was. So I would have been like early teen, and that for some reason, it, uh, Asian horror is very good, like very good at getting a mood and, and things like that. And that was that was the next time I, I actually was a bit unnerved to go to the mm-hmm. bathroom at night. I thought, oh no, that might be a ghost. I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> but that's I think that's 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 another one we could sort of table later on is the, yeah. the whole idea that there sensibilities from and i hate to use the term foreign horror yeah um horror from other countries um it's not foreign it's just it's it's just spoken in a different language yeah um but their sensibilities their history their 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 fairy tales their you know their backstory is so different from ours of course it's going to be unnerving it's going to be alien to you and i because we, we don't understand it yeah uh whereas maybe say in reverse say um Japanese horror were to sit and watch, say, an American slasher or something else, or like a possession movie, that might be terrifying for them because it's so different from what they're they're accustomed to or so used to. Yeah, but that's that's a really good one. I, I, I've, I'm going to have to rewatch that one. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. It holds up. It holds up quite well as well because I think I watched it quite recently. Um, I watched The Grudge and The Ring again because it was on. Uh, very quick tangent. My my partner got me a poster of a hundred horror films to rewatch. And those were on it, and it was the most enjoyable present I've had in a while because <laughs> I got to watch some great films. But whereas some, and I'm not criticising it because they're really good films, but the original grudge doesn't hold up as well, I've noticed. Uh, and I hate to say it, the remake or the American version, if you want to call it that, does okay. Yeah, it's okay, but A Tale of Two Sisters, for some reason, is still to this day as scary as it was when it first came out. In my opinion, of course. Um, but but wh- why is that? I, it's something I think with the the grudge they they tried to. 
I don't know, they, they jumped into it a bit more. They tried to show you a lot more where A Tale of Two Sisters was just subtle, but it was subtle and in your face without giving any spoilers because mm. everything was there from the mm. very beginning. <laughs> and when you get that realisation at the very end, uh, it's just a, it's a huge surprise because you think, well, of course, what happens, happens in it if you're going to go and see it again. Um, whereas The Grudge, I think they... they, they there's no body horror in it, but you remember it to be a bit gorier than it is, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But, is, it, is it one of those ones where it's like Sixth Sense? Yeah. It's a tale of two sisters, in your opinion. You could watch it once, and then at the end of the film, knowing what you know now, you could watch it again, and then it plays out as a completely yeah. different movie. Yeah. See, I see I love movies that do that. There's so many movies where they have that, and you look back and you go, right. Um, not to go off topic or go off genre, but uh, Inception is another one of those movies yeah. where you watch it once and then you could watch the movie again um, with a completely different perspective or a different view. And it plays out like a completely different movie, which is very, very clever. And it's, it's not been done um, yeah. I love, all that often. I really love rewatching films for that reason, like to get a different mm-hmm. experience every time or to get a comfortable experience. Like I will rewatch the same things over and over again. I've got comfort films, which we're probably about mm-hmm. to hit on soon. Mm-hmm. My, my partner's the opposite. She, every time I put on Halloween, again, she, you watched this the other day? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and I, I never got that, but I really, in, there's certain films I even, she herself will notice that, um, well, we'll re, sorry, she's just distracted me there. Uh, she's rewatched herself because, it, well, for that reason, if it's a good twist or a good, um, that she introduced me to Saw. I'd never seen it okay. but, until then. That came out of nowhere from me, the end of that, which, again, I, I don't know about giving too many spoilers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an old film now. <laughs> That's all I think. Uh, watching it in hindsight, knowing what you know, is a different experience to the first time I watched it, and I love that, and she herself will do that as well, I suppose. Um, my my personal history with that, that movie itself... Um, is I saw it in the cinema and knowing very little about it. There was a very sort of snippet of trailers. I think now we're kind of, and not trying to be disparaging to, to, to current day, is the whole idea that it's um, you're inundated with information and updates and stuff like that, whereas back, it would be almost 20 years ago, I think it came out in 2004. I just started college. Yeah. Uh, 2004, possibly 2005, and the build-up to that. I think it came out every Halloween. Yeah. Precursor to Halloween. But I watched it. I think I watched it every day for five days. And every day, a bit like The Ring, I would get other people to watch it as a means of getting somebody else to discuss it with or, you know, exposing somebody else to this this sort of type of movie. And some people can be very, dis, um, what's the word, dismissive. Yeah. Particularly of, of the first one and maybe the second one. Um, I was. Being dismissive. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it, it's... it's, it's, it's uh, pornography or horror porn and it's not it's something different it's a different spin on something that you've seen beforehand uh and it's not outside of the realms of possibility which then makes it terrifying you know you find her you find it later on in the different movies as to the their particular motivation as to why they've done these particular things but it's still it's, it's still within the realms of possibility because it's very it's very tactile yeah, it's very believable to a certain extent yes somebody would have to go to extreme lengths to accomplish that but still well, they could they could. <laughs> it's still it's well within the realms of, of possibility, um, but yeah, that's I think that's that's really fascinating as to mm. how people introduce you to different different genres of horror. But I, I watch that loads, and I would go back and watch that again because it's so clever. And especially the more you know about the movie, I think it was filmed in twelve days, shoestring budget. It's all written within the confines of one set with a couple of other set pieces around. Um, yeah, but yeah, really really clever, and then that kick started a whole franchise. Yeah, it's done well, and I mean, we're luckily we're we're aging up a little bit ourselves, even here, because our, our next topic was more about uh, adult lives as well, wasn't it? So, mm-hmm. I think it was it was more to do with nowadays. So, obviously, we've seen a lot more horror now. Uh, we're both huge fans of it. Are there any horror films that today or recently have actually scared or shocked or have left a, a lasting impact? Well, there's, a, there's an older film. I'll start with that one. One that still sticks with me um, is the first one, and then I'll kind of like fast forward to sort of present day. The one that still sort of gets me a little bit, um, and even the remake as well as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Hmm. 
The reason being, A, it was inspired, and we'll possibly touch this on on a later date, is it's inspired by true events, by uh, belief that it was based on Ed Gein, famous uh, American serial killer. Um, But the whole idea with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and I never thought about this until later on, until a friend of mine, Phil, mentioned that the reason why it's terrifying is because the bad guys don't get their comeuppance. That's a good point, actually. They get away with it. Nothing bad happens to the villains. They do all these horrible, horrific things. They kill all these teens, uh, people in their early 20s, etc. And they get away with it. She goes off in the truck, um, petrified to go off and sit and tell the story. Um, But they get away with it. There's no reprisal. There's no comeuppance for the villain. And that, for me, terrified me. Like, at the end of most slashers and most horror films, the bad guy gets a comeuppance or gets away, but severely injured. Um, and that that scared me. The whole idea that they can get away with it in such a backwater place, so we're so isolated and so removed, which would be if you were travelling across sort of parts of backwater America. Like I'm, I'm not going to drive down this dirt track. Yeah, it's going to make you think twice before you do something, and that's when you know a horror film's been affecting. That it makes you think about something that you didn't think about beforehand. An example being Jaws in the water. Yeah. I don't want to go in deep water because I watched Jaws as a child. And even though I know full where it's a work of fiction and the likelihood of me being attacked, never mind killed by a shark, I'm more likely to get struck by lightning yeah. or trampled by a cow. That, that's, that's how you sort of, <laughs> yeah. you know, not that I ever sort of trample through fields, etc. cetera, <laughs> in, the, in the countryside, but still you're, you're more likely to be killed by a cow than you are to be killed by a shark in open water. Um, so yeah, that was that was the whole idea that makes you think about something that you wouldn't have thought about beforehand, which makes it sort of very affecting. Um, fast forward to present day, certain ones, it's more so ones that are A, within the realms of possibility, or B, based on true events. So one of them is a film called Them, or Ills, I believe it's a French movie, uh, about this writer and I believe his partner moves into the Romanian countryside. Uh, the partner goes away, for the day and she's left in the house loads of spare tables and chairs darkness and shadows uh, and these kids just turn up and they decide that they're just going to kill this woman and they just chase her through the house and just that sort of mixture of the shadows the idea that they're that they're palpable they're that they're tactile that they're, they're children and that laughter as they're trying to get at this woman terrified me and it made me to the point of where I would turn lights on in rooms in order to make sure that there was nobody there Double check in the back door, to double check in the front door to make sure nobody would be able to to get into where I was living to prevent that from happening. Um, so that terrified me and still does to a certain extent. Um, other ones, you sort of as a touching point, uh, Midsummer. Midsummer is believable because the ideas and, and the, the topics in which they discuss and what it it's, it's, it leans into. Is that this religion that these people follow is no more ridiculous than any other religion? It is believable, which which makes it terrifying. You know, this could happen or could have already happened, and people have these beliefs, so they're they're going to do this particular action. So that that terrifies me, and I watch that entire movie, mouth agape, just sitting going, "WTF? What what is going on? What is happening? How is this going to get worse?" And what makes it even more terrifying, and we've probably touched on this beforehand, is that it happens all in the light of day. Yeah. yeah. It all happens to take place. No no shame, no darkness, no shadows, nobody being snuck off in order to do things. It just happens in open fields and open countryside with these beautiful people, with this lovely um, mannerisms and, and cadence and everything else. It's just, it's just terrifying. And I think that's... Yeah, I find that really affecting in, in current day. And then the other ones, uh, have you ever seen The Sacrament? The Sacrament, from from what I remember, is, I think it's a found footage movie. I could be misremembering, um, where it's about this cult that gets developed. And it's done by, um, is it Vice? It's done within the realms of it's a Vice documentary where they go to this cult in the middle of nowhere and they get dropped off and they're filming everything as it happens and stuff just goes sideways. Yeah. And that is entirely within the realms of possibility. Yeah. There is cults out there that, you know, have these extreme ideas or, you know, what you and I would consider to be extreme. Is their norm? Oh, that happens. Oh, that, that happens on a Tuesday. 
Yeah. Um, or that happens so many years down the line when somebody sort of outlives their usefulness just because somebody has this idea, this belief. And that's, that's terrifying to me. And then, and the last one is, uh, get out. Nice. Yeah. Have you, have you seen get out? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important film even as well. Right. Yeah. I, I would, I would wholly agree with you. It's a, it's important. And it's amazing how movies can make things not that they weren't relevant beforehand, but just make them more the zeitgeist for people's understanding people who maybe don't have that scope or that spectrum. Um, but yeah, get out. And I watched this very interesting interview. Um, the guy doing a podcast and he's talking to uh, Matthew Modine and he talks about how for a black audience watching Get Out, the most terrifying part of the movie is not to sit and scare anything for anybody, is the cop car turning up at the end. Mm. Just the flicker of the sirens and just thinking, oh no, now, he's get, now the, our protagonist, something's going to happen to them. Yeah, And that is, that is, that is terrifying for... for for people, and it's a different spin and a different perspective on the horror film. Yeah, but I think the idea of Get Out is is terrifying. It just makes you think that a little bit more. But I thought it was important as well as being as being terrifying. I thought it was very very well done. Oh, great. Uh, same same question to yourself. What 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 do you as an adult? Um, what what scares you as an adult? What what terrifies you? What gives you the little hairs in the back of your neck? Give it up. What's it called? Your uh, gets your hackle up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think we're quite similar in that respect, and it's probably down to just experience and the fact that we've lived longer, probably as well. That the things that are more realistic are the more possible to occur, are, mm-hmm. are the most scary. And I would have easily put Midsummer in there as well for exactly the same reasons, because mm-hmm. and mostly, and this is important as well, it is shot during the day, and from a filmmaker's point of view as well. When you think about it, if it's shot during the day, that means it's got nothing to hide because those people to themselves have done nothing wrong and that's that's terrifying I, I don't like that it's uncomfortable to me that somebody's that warped or, or a group of people just like any religion as you say any organized religion is exactly the same they believe this because and that's the interesting part there's no reason it's just because mm-hmm. um, and I, I don't like that for some reason it doesn't sit right with me um, so that one unnerved me and it's an incredible film so to say that we're scared or we, you know, we have a reaction doesn't mean we don't like it. It's a film I want to watch again, even. Um, plus, I like background things, and there's a lot of background stuff going on in that film as well. Um, I was going to say that it's it's one of those films that it rewards you for rewatching the movie, things that you wouldn't have picked up in beforehand, the imagery, yeah. the faces and stuff that show up in the trees in the background. Um, just make it very rewatchable and go back in and know that the the director Ari Aster has done a director's cut or a final cut. I can't remember how it was worded, where it's it's over three hours long. Yeah, I'd love However, to watch that. Oh. <laughs> we, should, we, we, should, we should re-watch it and, and, and discuss it amongst yeah. ourselves, which would be quite good because apparently, despite the film being longer, by I think it's about 45 minutes, I could be wrong, um, the pacing is, is faster. Oh, Things seem to progress quicker and quicker and seem to ramp up more, more um, consistently. Um, in the director's cut, you know, imagine watching a film for thirty, uh, sorry, three hours, mm. and and it seeming like it's a faster movie, like you just being so engrossed and you just sort of blink. Next thing you know, you've you've got you're confronted with the end of the movie, and it's just it's so affecting it. Yeah, like mm-hmm. how that how that actually works. Uh, that's interesting because apparently it touches more on certain aspects and the relationships between the people that are in the camp. Yeah. So then possibly you become more invested before. Not to spoil anything for anybody, you know, things kind of um, happen to them. And I think um, Stephen King, there's a, there's a quote, I'm possibly misquoting him here, is that he writes books and makes you fall in love with the characters. Yeah. And that's what he does the first part of the book. You know, so you care about them and then he puts them through hell. And yeah. I think he's pretty good at doing that. You know, they start off sort of, um, what's it called? It's a Castle Rock, Maine, or it's, um, what's the time called? Derry, oh yeah, um, Derry, Maine. So a lot of his films take place within the the uh, the, the town or the township of, of Derry. You fall in love with the characters, you kind of get to associate with them and empathise with them, and then things go sideways, um, yeah. which is what you want to do. You do, you know, you. 
I don't particularly want to watch a movie. I'd actually I'd tell a lie to. I want to watch movies where I don't care about the yeah. the um, the teens or the victims and the slasher or the killer or whatever. I'll just just cut through them. They just they just you know cannon fodder. But it's nice um, to actually start caring again though, because it's been so long, and this film does make you really care about the main character. Mm-hmm. And again, that's another aspect that kind of frightens me is how believable. Again, without spoilers, the boyfriend character in it. Mm-hmm. Is is very abusive, but it's believe it's not cartoony abusive. It's mm-hmm. not he's he's going around chatting up every every female character in the entire thing, mm-hmm. or or like you know I'm going to beat you now. I, I'm not making a joke or anything like that, but it's believably he's worn her down so much just by being the the type of person he is, and he himself wouldn't see that, and that's believable and it's scary and. He deserves everything he gets. Um, so. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's 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 very very good, very very well done, and I'm very excited to see as to what Ari Aster will be doing. Apparently, his next movie is going to be like four hours long or like three hours long with Joaquin Phoenix. So Ooh. the two of them mixed together would be would be exciting for me. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I, I heard it was going to be a slasher. Is that is that right? So. I, I'm, my understanding is it's, it's it's sort of I could be wrong I could have I could be <laughs> never never quote me on anything sort of I mentioned here but I think my understanding is about a man's descent into madness over the course of I think it's going to be like three or four hours long and as much as that might seem like a huge investment I would love to see that yeah, based on what the strong performance that have come from Joaquin Phoenix for the last twenty five years possibly forever more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, forever uh, and Ari Aster who has done two. Oh. Absolutely solid, phenomenal films. If this next um, film he's doing com- coming out is called Joker Two, I'll be so happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> um, and even even Joker, you could you could argue that that's a horror film to a certain extent yeah. about somebody's descent into madness. That's my um, next one, actually. To be honest, that was one of my picks. Um, I, I wasn't sure what you how you felt about it being a horror, but the way what I don't like is anything that hits so personally. Like after I saw the Joker, I felt like I had to speak to a doctor or something. Do you know what I mean? Because I related to him to a degree, and I thought, well, if if I don't know, it, I, the, his perform like, oh my god, I can't even begin. What unnerved me about it the most was you root for him. You know he can't possibly win because it's called Joker. He is the Joker. He's going to become the Joker. But throughout the entire film. You don't want him to be. You want Arthur to suddenly turn around and say, I'm going to get help. <laughs> and technically he loses. Though he's smiling and he's happy at the end, he failed. Mm-hmm. He, he Spoilers, everyone. He killed that guy and is now locked up for it. Or is he? But, but yeah, that, that, that's why part of me, possibly a smaller part of me, wants them to do another one. I'd love them to do another one, yeah. But in the same way, I was reluctant for them to do a sequel to The Shining. Yeah, I did. I don't want the sequel to confirm or deny any theories that people have generated as a result of a movie. Yeah, that's. Important. I'm very much of a yeah. Yeah, and I think I'm very much of the opinion that whatever somebody decides to take away from a movie, their opinion, their perspective, their 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 view on it is is up to them. Once mm. somebody makes a film. To a certain extent, I, I'm of the belief that it no longer belongs to them. Yeah, it belongs to the viewer, so they can make up whatever view they wish of it, you know. And that's that's their own personal perspective on what's going on. It's a really prism. good point, it's actually. The... Yeah, that's such a good point. Whereas... When you think about it, they they've decided why they like it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, cool. <laughs> and for for better for worse, the, you know, there are going to be people who are out there and genuinely love certain movies. So maybe I wouldn't enjoy as much, but if they enjoy it, you know, if that makes them happy or exactly. they take some enjoyment away. Then brilliant, but with with Joker, there's so many little bits and pieces just dotted and threaded the whole way through the movie. I wouldn't want them to confirm or deny whether it was correct yeah. or not, yeah. and I want people to still have that. Oh no, no, that that opinion, that theory that you had in the movie. Oh, that's that's not true. I don't want that to happen. Or just do um, it again, like with the second one. Make it just as. <laughs> Yeah, it's make open. it the whole idea that continues with that thread or goes in a completely different direction. Yeah, because um, it's the it's the whole on the on the flip side of the Joker that there's that there was a theory that um, 
Batman is in an insane asylum after witnessing his parents, spoiler word, brutally murdered in a back alley behind a, it's either a cinema or an opera house or a theatre, depending on which version you've seen. It's possibly more. Don't quote me on that again. Mm. Um, where every person, every villain that he comes across is a different carer or a different member of staff. So the Joker could be somebody who works in the insane asylum who makes a bit of a joke and a bit of a laugh and he's decided to vilify that person because he's not allowing him to escape yeah. the um, the insane asylum. So he is trapped with his grief and his anger and his one for vengeance. So I think that's that's really quite clever. So it's um, if that's somebody's opinion or theory on what's happened with, with Batman, then, yeah. then so be it. Then great. But I think but I think Joker's very, very important because it's a study on, on mental health. Yeah. But it's not and, and, he's the villain because he's got mental health as well. It's He, he was always pretty much a villain he failed Mm -hmm. himself as well as whoever he he hurts as well um i think they they handled it well like he wasn't he wasn't off his meds when he did that in fact he was on them he was so Mm -hmm. broken and so distant and that's important i think because it's not a film i'm not i I never got sorry i never got scared (laughs) but it was like a lasting thing do you know what i mean it's something that really stuck Plus the soundtrack's beautiful, so. You know. But go on, oh, sorry. It's, it's yeah. filmy done. Uh, it brings me on to my next one because uh, we could spend all day sitting picking apart Joker. Yeah. Um, it's the one that kind of that affected me the most, and then I felt like I had to talk to somebody about it, and we could spend a full episode talking about this as well. Is Martyrs? Oh yeah. Martyrs. Yeah. I have seen it once, possibly. Same. It's possibly ten. I think it might be two thousand and eight. I could be wrong. The movie came out. I watched it once. My good friend Steve, we uh, both had a day off. We sat in his lovely house uh, in the northeast of England in Newcastle. We watched One Down, Two to Go, which is a phenomenal black exploitation film. Then we watched a French horror movie called Frontiers, the S being in brackets afterwards, which is about neo Nazi cannibals. <laughs> and then, so it's kind of ramped up straight away. And then we watch Martyrs. What a one to end on. Jeez. <laughs> Oh. And for those of you, and you've you've probably agreed with me in, in the past, is that whenever we watched uh, Martyrs, it's a bit like Bishop Brennan from Father Ted, whenever he's been kicked up the arse and then he gets asked any questions and it's like, Wayne, are you all right? Oh. <laughs> That's it. Well, what have you been doing this afternoon with Steve? Oh. <laughs> and that, that was that was the whole, my whole reaction. And... I've watched it once and I still haven't the guts to watch it again. And I would love to go back and watch it now, knowing how the movie ends. Yeah. Or I maybe possibly want to do it where I've left it enough time between whenever I first watched it, which might be even 10 years ago, maybe a little bit less, and then watch it now is to see as to my, how my view is. It. Am I now a little bit more desensitised to it or is it still raw? Because mm. even mentioning it to friends or even yourself still gives me, unnerves me. And it's it's not yeah. horror. It's not horror in the traditional sense, in my opinion. That it's not scary. There's bits of it which are, are quite scary, possibly in the second act. Because uh, agree with me or disagree with me, it's a film of three parts. There's oh, yeah. the opening bit, the bit in the middle, and then the bit at the end, which for me personally is the bit that is most horrifying. Yeah. It's not scary. It's more so the idea that what is happening is horrific. It's so uncomfortable as well. It, it's an amazing film. Um, we're not again. This isn't like a, don't watch this. It's awful. It's please, please watch it if, yeah. if it's something you wish to to be moved. Uh, and if if a movie can imbue, is that the word? Yeah. If, uh, if, if if a movie can Stick provide, to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that I'm I'm forever marked. Yeah. by watching that movie. It, it's and one of those. Not sit- it become the bar, so everything is now compared to. Martyrs, do you know what I mean? It's like that was grim, but not as bad as Martyrs. Oh, that was as good as Martyrs. Oh, that that is now the bar to which things are measured. Like, <laughs> yeah, and it's there's two films again mentioned generally within the same breath of each other. Is Serbian movie, which I have no intention of watching because I don't, I don't wish to put myself through that through that. No, but Martyrs, I think, has something to say. Tell me if I'm wrong. Anybody who potentially listens to this, oh, yeah. uh, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't. I don't wish to put myself through that. Knowing what I know about the movie, but Martyrs, I think, is very. It's unrelenting. It, it, it provides somebody with a feeling, um, uh, a thought process for the space of the the hour yeah. and a half, two hours that the movie lasts, 
Um, and I wish to tell other people or I w- wish to speak to other people to see their view on it. Yeah. You know, some people say it as a, as a flight of fancy, you know, that it's all oh, they laughed through the movie. Whereas me, I just sat there in total silence, didn't move for the, the length of the movie. And then just afterwards, still, still affected by it, which I think is, if a movie can do that, then you know, that's been yeah. done very, very well. It, it, it and, reminds me, it's the sort of thing, you know, when you're watching a film with someone and they're, they're, they're on their phone. Nothing drives me more mad than that, where they just sat there twiddling around on their phone when Halloween's on or something. Mark, as you can't do that. It's the type no. of phone you've got your phone down on silent and you're in. And if you're not, you, you've missed it <laughs> like for any amount of time. It's it's great. I, I could watch that movie with full root canal happening. Somebody could be doing <laughs> minor oral surgery on me. Oh, <laughs> tubes hanging out of my mouth. Light shining in my eye. Somebody with a suction tube taking all the saliva out of my ma- mouth. Somebody asking me to rinse out with that that green or blue or purple stuff. Yeah. I can't remember what it is. There's blood everywhere. <laughs> it's just like oh. exactly. <laughs> oh. Um, it's, it's like the um, there's a scene in I believe it's it's a Wayne's World one or two where he goes to see a, a, a Kenny G movie or a movie with Kenny G, oh, which yeah. is like a famous. It's a clar- clarinet player, yeah, and he's just sitting watching Kenny G, and he's having oral <laughs> surgery done to him, and he's just so <laughs> horrified by the music that he doesn't realise that he's getting root canal carried out. But yeah, it's one of those films I was entirely transfixed. My leg could be on fire. <laughs> yeah, so good. So they could be actively stabbing me with a very small ice pick <laughs> in the kidneys, and I would have been completely oblivious to the fact that that was happening. Just be like, I'm going to say because I need to say this bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's so. It's so horrific, and my friend, and I would probably agree with him, is possibly one of the most powerful, uh, like I said, I hate to use this term, foreign film. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, it's such, a, such an amazing film. I would suggest to anybody who, who likes horror to watch it. It is phenomenal. Um, I've yet to watch the American remake, but from my understanding, not to, you know, we wish to stay positive and, you know, in the love and sort of spirit of horror, not to be disparaging to it, but I just don't wish to, to watch it. I just want to stick with the, the original. Yeah. Um, if, because if that is might, the one that affects. Yeah, if it might jade your view at all, I'd, I'd rather not risk it. Um, I, or or we could, you, you could play devil's advocate and say maybe it has something else to say. It true. puts a different spin on it or makes it maybe more more believable, more realistic due to the fact that they're, they're speaking the same language that both you and I speak Good natively. Point. But yeah. but I think is I I would struggle to see as the how a movie would would have the same impact. Yeah. Maybe if you watch the American one first. Yeah, that would have been then, the better then, way, probably. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you know what, I'd be and interested if if anyone listening, if there is anyone listening, <laughs> has seen both and disagrees, I would be you know, if if you've just let me know. Just say, oh, actually, the American one was way better, and here's why. I'll, I'll jump feet first. <laughs> and there'd be the, there's, there's no right and there's no wrong answer. Of course. If somebody enjoyed the if somebody enjoyed the American remake, then then so be it. That's that's phenomenal. That's really really good. You've enjoyed that movie, and you possibly enjoyed it more than the original. Then that's fine. Um, it's more than fine. It's it's great. You know, you've enjoyed the film. Yeah. That's what we're. That's what it's, you, it's all about. So. Movie going. <laughs> you've been, yeah, I know. <laughs> that's the point. And that's why I never got uh, these these negative reviewers because they'll, they'll watch things just to be miserable. It's like, well, why are you watching it? That's why we, we've done horror and not like romance, <laughs> drama. <laughs> oh, how did you feel about the movie? I felt horrible. <laughs> then why did you watch it? <laughs> there's, 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 there's no point in life. I'm just going to go and be melancholy for the rest of my life. You know, it's just it's, you know that's why I love horror. It's so for the most part removed from real life yeah. it's, it's a form of escapism and I think that's more important now than ever I think it's, it's really really good to sort of watch yeah. something that is so ridiculous or so just takes out you there. out of your yeah. life for a moment and puts mm-hmm. you in somebody else's um, I've actually I've still got one more as well with this as well uh, I'm going we'll mm-hmm. go off on huge tangents sorry everyone <laughs> <laughs> that's fine <laughs> but um, it, it's a more bog standard horror so we've gone from um, Midsummer to Joker to what is essentially it's a slasher film uh, film I'll be honest and I was surprised because I'd never seen it before and it mm-hmm. was one of the inspirations to Halloween even which is something would, I'm going to talk about so much that you'd be sick of um, but I remember and it was only it was about seven years ago I watched this for the very first time and it genuinely it stuck with us to the point I had to put a chair and I'm not joking here at my bedroom door and it was the original Black Christmas 
Now, the the reason for that is we had a, a loft in pretty much the exact same way that was mm-hmm. just outside my bedroom door. And the house, it was a Victorian built house, creaks an awful lot at night. <laughs> so, I, I, yeah. <laughs> now, I've seen both remakes as well. And again, not to talk too negatively about them. They're in no shape or form the same film. If you've not seen the original, and the, I'll be honest for everyone listening, it is on YouTube for free to view. It's still unnerving now. Like I'll watch it, and I, I think there's something about the character Billy, the way he talks to people on the phone, the fact that it's an old film, so I'm going to give you spoilers, I'm sorry. <laughs> the fact that he, again, doesn't get his comeuppance, which I thought was interesting you mentioned um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He gets away with it. He's still there. He's also, at the very end, about to kill the main character as well. <laughs> and the fact there's just so much ambiguity about him, he'll talk on the phone. He's having a almost a conversation with himself. Or is he? Is there more than one person? The fact, during the filming as well, four different people play Billy just keeps you guessing. It, it, it's, oh, I love that film, I'll be honest. But it's even now, it's still it's one of those films that, that I refuse to let my partner watch and she keeps saying that she wants to watch it because I, I know how terrified she gets just watching any type of horror that will make mm-hmm. her boot her pants <laughs> to be honest but yeah it's it's, it's yeah you, you kind of want to protect your your loved ones or your friends or whatever from watching certain particular movies because it might it might be affecting that way and you know both you and I being the warped yeah uh, dark humoured in, individuals that we are that's that's <laughs> sort of uh we can we can digest it. We can deal with it. We can move past it, and just see it for the for the flight of fancy that it is. Um, but yeah, that's 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 really interesting. It's in a Black yeah. Christmas. Uh, hands up, I've not seen any of the three of them, so I will add that to my list um, of homework for me to sit and watch and sort of get your spin on it. And oh, yeah. despite you kind of telling me how it plays out, that doesn't take away from what happens between the start and the end of the movie. It's 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 uh, <laughs> not trying to sound too philosophical about it. It's about the journey. Yeah, it's about the journey from yeah. the start to the finish. It's not about the start point or the end; it's the journey, boys it's, and girls. It's about how you get there. No, <laughs> it's it, how you it, get there. It's the type of film, though, because it, it's one of those. When I first watched it, and I think for those seven years when I did watch it, I've watched it mm-hmm. every year at Christmas time, and sometimes mm-hmm. also at Halloween time as well, um, mm-hmm. because it's it's so beautifully done. It's got John Saxon in it. It's Margot uh, Margot Kidder. Uh, Lewis Margot Lane. Kidder. Yeah. Mar- yeah. Mm-hmm. John Saxon playing exactly the same character as he did in Nightmare as well. But that's another mm-hmm. one. It kind of, when you, I didn't realize you'd not seen it. I'm sorry, but. Um, no, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. There's, there's humor elements to it. And I think it's that, that peaks and troughs sort of thing going on. You've got this, the tension it builds is amazing. And then all of a sudden, there'll just be this hilarious little segue. Mm-hmm. But then death again. <laughs> it's just, uh, that's, it just, it, you, you can feel your stomach when you're watching it, it just clench. And then relax. If you've got an attic, by the way, uh, Wayne, <laughs> <laughs> you'll you'll see what I mean. Um, but again, to go on uh, off on another tangent, and I don't like talking too negatively about films. I saw the the remake when we were allowed to um, at Christmas time. It would have been a year and a bit ago, I think, when that f- mm-hmm. actually just came out. That. <laughs> When you're on about the difference between the Martyrs original and remake, how different they could be, I don't see mm-hmm. how different they could have made Black. It's like too different. I mean, class that as a horror film. It, it's more of a documentary about boring things. Um. <laughs> but that, but again, that's that's your perspective. That's yeah. that's your your honest opinion of it. Oh, Somebody may absolutely. enjoy the remake or the the, the, the subsequent remake um, more than they enjoyed the original. Um, it depends on somebody's perspective and view and everything else. If that's what they enjoy, then, then brilliant. Um, I'd love sort of someone to, to come into the, the comments to just tell me why it was. Because if you do enjoy it, I would love to know why. I think because I hold such a strong love for the original that mm-hmm. I, I didn't allow myself to a degree as well. So and you said you only watched that seven years ago? The original one, yeah. 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 So yeah. that's it's not as if you, you, you associate that and there's an element of, of rose tinted glasses whenever you watch it as a child. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, I always associate that with, with growing up and that you've got that sort of sentimental attachment to it. You've only watched it seven years ago, which is not particularly long ago, so it's not as if you've had maybe decades of being attached to it and being yeah. 
protective of it. It's a case of you watch it less than a decade ago, and that is the one that you enjoy, despite the fact that the remake came out possibly 10 or more years ago. Um, I think the, well, the second remake, because there's two now, uh, one of them was 2009, and the most recent one was mm-hmm. 2019. So it's uh it's got Michelle Trachtenberg from uh Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Is she not in it in the sequ- in the, the, the remake? The O nine one, yeah. That one yeah. actually is worth watching, I'll be honest. It's not it it's a very um naughty's horror film. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But it it's got none of the mood. That's fine though, if that's what you want for a horror film. Whereas the the most recent remake, it feels almost a bit more like a lecture, I'll be honest. It's not it's beautifully shot, I'll give it that. But that, that's the last I'm going to say on it. <laughs> yeah, so the thing is, what, what we sort of set out to do was, was just to try and be as positive as we possibly yeah, exactly. can. And there is going to be movies that both you and I are not going to enjoy, and we'll just try and steer away from that because we want to stick to the things that we, we generally enjoy, and, and hopefully the, other people will do the, the original, same, or if they wish to. Yeah, mm-hmm. the, the original, in, in, in some ways, is an incredibly important film because it was the very first uh, holiday based killer as well. Mm-hmm. So, without would that, that being before. Oh yeah. We, we, was it before or after? Because this I watched a few years ago, very luckily with, with some very close friends. Uh, I think it's called Better Watch Out. Not Better Watch Out. Uh, yeah, Better Watch Out, or it was a Christmas Evil, and that's a that's a, a hello uh, like a Christmas based horror film. I think it came after Black Christmas, if I'm entirely honest. I'm trying. To remember. Um, I think Black Christmas was seventy four. So you, I don't know. If I that... think it was after. Oh, was I think it? so. Yeah. Um, so it's about a guy who works in a toy factory and I think it gets shut down and he basically loses his mind, uh, dresses up as scent and goes on a, a bit of a killing spree. Uh, but it's a film, it's got two, Christmas Evil and it's a better watch out because it's at the whole um, Christmas song. Oh, you right, yeah. watch out. Oh. That one, because that's, that's what it's about. Um, but that was it. it was a, I really, really enjoyed that, watching it with friends um, in a big screen and then just everybody laughing at the same point because they've all seen it beforehand and I hadn't and that was quite nice to kind of almost get that prompt to oh this is the bit everybody laughs at everybody enjoys that um, but that was that was one of, but I think I came after uh, 74 for Black Christmas so I really like um, Christmas as a setting as well for a horror I don't know why it's one of those that they never get any amazing and I will say Black Christmas original is an amazing film and even those ones that you mentioned there but they, they always seem to get almost Hammy, and I like that. I actually do, especially at Christmas, because I like Jack Frost, the horror mm-hmm. version. I mean, I, I, I like it. But they're always that kind of horror. But there's something mm-hmm. about it, if it's done correctly, because it's such a joyous time, for someone to just come in and ruin it in such a horrible way could be really horrific. So mm-hmm. it's, it's definitely worth a watch. There's a, there's a few ones that you sort of around holidays, etc. Is it Silent Night, Deadly Night? Oh, yeah. So it's got that recently. iconic imagery with the... Uh, <laughs> With the uh, was it a hatchet or an axe, just hey, hey. hanging with the arm hanging out of the Christmas tree, and hey. I think they did a couple of sequels and then a remake. Uh, I've not watched that one. I will have to add that to my list of ones to sort of make my way through. Might watch Surprisingly, them sort of... yeah, good as well. Yeah, the first one anyway. Um, but um, oh, what was what was I going to mention beforehand? Because we talked about uh, we talked about earliest memory of horror, uh, what scared us as a ch- as children, uh, what scares us as an adult. Um, I'm trying to think. Is it sort of? Yeah. Well, we had a, a few questions set up, but we I've noticed the time there. So I think, <laughs> yeah. So we might want to because we can keep the the other ones mm-hmm. for you, and we'll keep you all in suspense as to what they are. But we, the 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 big one, which might be worth mentioning here, um, I think mm-hmm. the next question itself was, and I'd be very interested to know yours, your mm-hmm. all time favorite horror movie. Which I think is important to introduce ourselves with as well. So, <laughs> um, it's it's one of those things. I think it's you're trying to get me to Sophie's Choice. <laughs> yeah, the a particular a particular uh, movie. It's like trying somebody tell me, you know, what, what's what's your favorite dog? What's your favorite child? What's your favorite whatever? Yeah. Not that I have children. Um, <laughs> I love your favorite idea. piece of string. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, what's your favorite? What's your favorite leg? You know, it's just, yeah. I want to keep both of them. I don't want to have to pick between the two of them. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've got two, and I think it fluctuates depending on my mood. And there's possibly a few other people out there who would who would share the same perspective that it depends on what mood you're in at that particular time. Yeah. So my two, and they're not going to come across as particularly original or new or exciting. 
is Jaws. Nice. Um, and The Thing. So nice. Jaws for me, particularly since they remastered it, is perfect. I, I could quite happily put that on at any time of the day and sit and be drawn in, enjoy it from start to finish because it, it does that thing very cleverly, as you mentioned before, had about comedy be comedy being a, a, a horrific a, a horror tool that it's it's the whole idea that it has little points of uh, comedy throughout the movie and it has nice little breathers and it just sort of ramps it up and then back down and it just does it so cleverly throughout the course of the movie that it's perfect for me I, I don't think there's a single thing that I would change or alter not that I'm in a position in order to alter or make any criticisms of a movie but I think it's perfect I think it's, oh, it's an amazing movie yeah. Um, and it's still want to watch it today. I'm... <laughs> yeah, but it's it's uh, there's a documentary I think called The Shark Still Works, and it's the idea that this one particular movie, based off a book that came out in the seventies, was the first ever summer blockbuster. Because I believe my understanding was that movies used to get rolled across America or across the world, and it would like week by week, month by month, and it would sort of move as a wave across America or the world, mm. and we possibly wouldn't get it for months later. It was the first summer blockbuster where I think it got a universal release date in America and then a universal release date across the UK rather than having to travel through like a like a carnival or a circus going through your town or your area and where you live. That it was the first summer blockbuster. We want everybody to watch this at the same time. Uh, and it still works to this day where people, regardless of age, have watched that movie, still don't wish to go in deep water yeah. for fear of getting eaten by Jaws or Bruce, as he was known. <laughs> yeah. um, which I think it's perfect. It's just a phenomenal movie, which I enjoy, not for the scary aspects of it, despite the bit where they find the head in the boat. Still, mm. even though I know it's coming, I jump every single time. Everybody jumps at that. You can it, and if you if you say you didn't, you're lying. <laughs> you're lying. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal movie. The yeah. soundtrack's fantastic. The cast is amazing. The, the source material is phenomenal. Uh, and everything else that's done about it, the characters are believable. You know, somebody wishes to keep the beach open in order to keep the economy going for this particular area, but also juxtaposition with with people getting killed by this 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 man eating shark. Um, it's phenomenal. I think it's 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 an example for me, a perfect movie. Oh yeah, it's executed so well, and it's it's still. You don't have to be into horror in order to enjoy it. I think a lot of people enjoy it because that sort of uh, the, the score for the movie is so well done because it has quite sort of uplifting aspects of the music and then it just delves back into that sort of um string quartet music which is which is phenomenal mm. so it's it still stick with me and that's one that i rewatched again and again and again as a kid even the sequel as well i thoroughly enjoy that one because it's still chief brody yeah it's really really well done but i love love the idea of that movie and being done so well and i think any subsequent shark movie will ultimately get compared to that that every time the, the, <laughs> That the shark movie, and I like what other people have tried to do with other movies, but in my opinion, pales in comparison. I don't think any other movie, and I would love to be proven wrong, is as a, as a, is as affecting mm. as Jaws is and was. Yeah, like you might uh, you might remember that. Oh, it wasn't that great that part in Deep Blue Sea where Samuel Jackson got eaten. Yeah, but do you remember that part where Chief Brody? <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're, you're always going to go yeah. back to Jaws, aren't you? <laughs> because mm-hmm. yeah. it's a phenomenal film um, just so well done and then the other movie uh, is The Thing Yeah, the Thing for me personally uh, worshipping at the altar is John Carpenter uh, Kurt Russell whom I've got a tattoo taken up the back of my left calf um, is just phenomenal um, great soundtrack by Ennio Morricone some of the music being done by John Carpenter as well phenomenal cast uh, and it's I think what why I love it so much is because I could rewatch it. I watch it probably about four, possibly five times a year by myself. Yeah. Sometimes with a whiskey, sometimes not, to kind of get myself into the, the same frame of reference as everybody else. Sometimes with uh, a chess and... machine and whiskey as well. <laughs> <laughs> she's, uh, she's losing it. Um, but yeah, that's that's one of those things. It was um, is it Adrian Barbo does the voice of the chess wizard. Yes, yeah. It is, which is I never knew for a few years I'm, afterwards. I'm going to geek out on you here a little bit, sorry, because uh, I'm a uh-huh. I'm a huge chess person, and uh, I used to compete even. Now I've watched that film so often that I realised, as Kurt Russell's playing the chess um, machine that he's playing before he breaks it, calling her a cheating b-word. She in fact did cheat. <laughs> 
because the move she... that she reads out is not a, a, a valid move if you look at the screen. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a, it's a film that I rewatch, and every time I watch it, and we've discussed it as well, whereby at what point people get turned, you know, at certain oh, perspectives yeah. of it, and you know, not to ruin anything for anybody, the, 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 actually will give you the, 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 the opportunity to discuss it, which is the blood testing scene. Oh, yeah. Because I bet you point out that uh, was Kurt Russell. You don't see him drawing the blood yeah. whenever he tests it, which means that he could realistically be the thing. At that point. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, exactly. And I think it's a phenomenal film. And it is in itself a remake. Yeah. So instead of the thing from outer space, and it's one of those things that it had something different to say. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's an important film as well because uh, something we've, we've kind of discussed possibly for a later um episode would be allegories you know what a movie can represent maybe whenever it was uh incepted and created at the time and then what's happened years down the line whenever it's sort of become different yeah you know different people's views on it you know is it is it an allegory for communism is it an allegory for hiv and aids etc there's there's loads of different ones you could go down the route of body horror because they look the same as everybody else but they have this this apparent terrible secret or this this monster living inside them but the thing i think it's because i can re-watch that again and again and have a different view or a different perspective or realize something about it that i didn't realize that i had I'd, I'd seen before um child's breath at the end of the movie the the yeah. prospect of the, in the bottle of whiskey it's kerosene rather than j and b rare whiskey yeah um it's, it's it's different theories that people have in the movie and i think that's phenomenal i think that's really really clever so, depending on what time of day or what time of year or how I'm feeling at that particular time, I would probably say Jaws is a summer movie for me. Mm. And then the thing is more of a winter, colder. I want to hunker down in the darkness and sit and watch the thing. Yeah. Watch this thing. What a, what a, <laughs> yeah, watch this thing, this the thing. thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just it's an incredible movie yeah. um, with practical effects again, which makes it then timeless. Um what about yourself? What, yeah. What's your sort of your favorite horror film of all time? Um, well, I'm I'm a massive Carmen fan as well, and you've already touched upon one of mine, which was also the thing, which is probably why we get <laughs> out so incredibly well. For mm-hmm. again, all of those reasons, we've we've discussed pretty much a lot of it already. But again, it's it's all down to the fact you can sit down and rewatch that, and I have seen that probably coming up to a hundred times now, and take something different away from it, even today. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. There's there's nothing wrong with it. There's not if you again from a filmmaker's perspective because I, I've been involved with it. So I I've mentioned earlier to yourself um, off um, recording a little bit that I, I find it difficult sometimes to watch films because I've ne- for a very long time I've never watched a film without working out or trying to work out how this film's been made or mm-hmm. what work's gone behind it. Which is why it's important. I think like we were saying there to be just positive about it. Because there's a lot of bloody work goes into it, um, but dialogue-wise, in terms of the thing, there is not a wasted piece of dialogue in that entire film. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of great films, Psycho, which a lot of people are going to probably crucify me for here. There's wasted dialogue in it. There's all sorts of every line the the policeman says is pretty much a wasted bit of dialogue, but it's necessary. It's fine. Mm-hmm. The thing, everything in it's important because those people at any point could be a thing. So you're you take everything under that microscope. It's an important film again, but again we, we've gone through it, so I won't go into that one too much. But my other one, and these are, are basically the way I was trying to think of it was: what film? If I'm in a bad mood, if I'm in a good mood, if I'm indifferent, what film could I put on and enjoy in exactly the same way? The thing's one of them. Um, mm-hmm. after the way you were describing Jaws I would love to put that in there as well but I might watch that later on but my main one you're, you're going to know already is Halloween mm-hmm. that, that is it, for me that, that's just my favourite because I love the time of the year as well so I'm already jaded um, <laughs> or biased if you want to go with that because I just I, it's not the dress up or anything there's just something about the air I love Halloween as a day during the night, the atmosphere, everybody's of the same mind. Mm-hmm. Not to mention, in the film itself, that theme is just perfect. <laughs> like, um, There was a, a funny story I heard about it once. It was John Carpenter wanted to get into music when he was growing up, so his dad bought him a drum kit. 
and taught him the beat, which was the theme to Halloween. So his dad inadvertently wrote one of the most iconic themes in all of cinema. Um, mm-hmm. Not to mention, I, I really enjoy, in, again, as much as the thing is similar, Michael Myers, the way he was before the sister thing came into it and then was removed in the more recent one again, um, is just, he's walking death. So mm-hmm. it, when I mentioned about films that kind of frightened me a little bit, that idea is frightening. The movie itself, I, I, I like it too much to ever get any sort of fear from it. The idea that you can't reason with him. He, mm-hmm. he is going to get you no matter what, despite his slow pace. He might even outthink you because he's very cunning compared to the likes of Jason and things like that as well. Mm-hmm. And so incredibly strong for him to be able to pick up like Bob one-handed as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. That you're just not going to win. And you do you feel for the likes of Laurie, you feel for the likes of despite the fact that they're supposed to be a bit more irritating, but you've got Annie and um I forget her name. Oh my goodness, it's my favourite film. <laughs> but the the side characters as well are kind of believably likably in a way real as well. Um and it, it, I think it's interesting because you pick two films that I would agree with are just perfect in terms of nothing's wasted the way they're mm-hmm. made, there's a few errors in Halloween. You see John Carpenter's cigar smoke at one point, you, you know what I mean? There's continuity errors and things. But again, with me being a filmmaker, and I wanted to be a filmmaker since being a child, probably because of this film, for me it's a mm-hmm. very important film. This was made on mm-hmm. 10 grand. And it's made... 10 grand? 10 grand. I, that, that is phenomenal. I never knew that was the case. So that must have been made on like a a shoestring budget with a lot of people sort of chipping in in order to make yeah. this most this film it. this film happen. Yeah, most of that went on Donald Pleasant as well. So the rest of it... Who, <laughs> I think to this day, I think is still the actor that has acted in the most horror films ever. Yeah, yeah probably. I think, I think, and I think uh, second is Vincent Price or Ooh. Christopher Lee. I could, be, I could be wrong. This is the top five you would kind of believe. I was going to so say, Donald Christopher Pleasant's, Lee not beat him? I could be wrong, and I, I think whatever I last checked, I think it was, I could be wrong, Donald Pleasance, and then Christopher Lee's up there, along with, say, Peter Cushing nice. and Vincent Price, all of which whom I love and, and hold a lot of time you, for, yeah. which, is, which is... You've just listed my top like five favourite actors, to be honest with <laughs> you, that's class. But no, um, it's funny you mentioned Christopher Lee as well, he was down for the part for Dr Loomis. Um, and he turned it down. Oh, yes, I read about that. That's yeah. amazing. I don't know why he turned it down. I can't remember why. But uh, I can't imagine the series itself may have done as well, to be honest, to have Michael Myers, who Nick Castle's quite a tall fella, but to square off against Dracula, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, there's something I about the that. mask as well, like when we're going on to just why I love it so much. I, I think because I remember hearing a, a story, sorry to go on and on a bit. But no, I, no, go ahead. Um, I heard something about the originally they went through five different types of masks, one of which that they, they landed on was a clown mask, hence why young Michael has a clown mask. Mm-hmm. And Nick Castle come out with a clown mask on, and I can't remember who it was who had the William Shatner mask in his uh, boot, painted it up, shaved the sideburns, did something with the eyebrows, gave it to Nick, and when he walked out, a lot of the interns, because most of the crew were interns, left the room they were so scared, they knew <laughs> there and then they've got an icon. Mm-hmm. And that's so important that the, the likes of Carpenter could have been so easy for him to say, no, we've got this script, we want a killer clown. You wouldn't have had a franchise with a killer clown. Or may not have, no. anyway. And it's important to listen to your actors, I think, sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's one of those things that it's such a an iconic mask. And uh, the fact that William Shatner didn't low for, I think it was decades. Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, it was it was his mask painted white with a bit of weight, you know, teased the hair out a little bit, and it's it's William Shatner running around, hugging ladies or you know putting ladies to sleep. Because <laughs> yeah. it was it was initially known as it was at the Babysitter Murders. That was the original title, yeah, yeah. So I'm... and then they changed it to Halloween, which which is I think much more iconic. Yes, it does stamp it to a particular time of year, but then you know exactly what you're getting into. There's a particular color palette, it's a particular time of year. There's a certain feel and aesthetic to that time of year, which I think is is really really yeah. clever, uh, and I could quite happily say as yourself sit and watch that at any point, and it's it's very very well done. And not to go off topic, 
the the recent um, sequel, which disregards any other sequel that's happened since the original back in 1978. Is that right? Yeah. Um, it's it's so well done. Yeah. It just runs with the idea uh, and disregards any subsequent sequels that happen. It's really, really, really good and manages to keep that aesthetic and that feel and that that sense of dread and the fact that he is just a force of nature. Yeah. He kills be- because there's no there's no rationale, there's no thought process. It's just he kills because. And the mask it really does come through as well. He's just an emotionless. I, I hit my mic. Sorry, guys. He's an emotionless wall of death. You can beg it and plead. He's not going to listen. If you're in his way, he'll he'll take you out. And I really enjoyed, okay. yeah, the 2018 one. I thought it was amazing. And I'm looking forward to I the mean, new one. So, is it uh, kills? Yeah, Robin kills. Yeah, I cannot wait for that. Yeah, I, I hope they do what they did with Back to the Future two and three and release uh, <laughs> release kills and ends at the same time. That would be amazing. They won't because are they doing? Are they filming them both back to back? Are they not? Yeah. Which is really, really good, which means that they can release the first one, see what the reactions are to it to a certain extent, and then sort of play about and edit with the sequel in order to kind of make it as, as sort of as important as the, as the first one that he did back yeah. in 2018. But I think it's a phenomenal sequel. Oh, definitely. And the, the main thing, and this is my round on um, the, the last thing I'll say on, on this question, I suppose. The, mm-hmm. we, we've talked about a lot of important films in terms of important to society, to films in general. And Halloween is important because it, it defined the slasher genre. It wasn't the mm-hmm. first, but it was just like Godzilla and King Kong. Godzilla wasn't the first, but he defined etc. So Michael Myers is now the, the first icon. Mm-hmm. So in that regard, it's it's important. But I think why it's my favourite is, to me, it's very personally important. It's why I got into media, why I studied media, and why I want to make a movie. <laughs> I just want to be John Carpenter, apparently. So. Oh. Um, I, I hold a, an insane amount of love for. And yeah, he's just phenomenal. And just uh, from what I've heard, a, a genuinely nice guy who yeah. just likes to, as I'm told, smoke tabs, yeah. play video games and make music with his, with his kids, yeah. which is which is phenomenal. Um, and people have tried to imitate or recreate what he's done beforehand. And I think he just has, and tell me if I'm wrong, just has the thought process of, Go ahead, yeah. see if you can do better, and very few get close yeah. or surpass. I don't think anybody has surpassed him in, in the genres in which he's done. Uh, in my in my opinion, yeah. um, he does welcome it but, as well. He's not like you were saying. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. He, he he's not like go ahead, try it. You're not going to succeed. He's he's actually go ahead, make it your own. And um, the remake mm-hmm. Halloween, he actually said that to Rob Zombie, who came up and said, "I've been." Uh, Oh, I can't remember. It was a Dimension Films came up to him and asked him if he wanted to make uh, the remake Halloween. And mm-hmm. John Carpenter, apparently with his cigar, just laughed and said, "Yeah, make it your own, dude." And that was it. Mm. <laughs> um, with with the the recent one with was it Danny McBride? I believe. Tell me if I'm wrong. And I think it's um, is it David Gordon Green? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I'm gonna quickly. Yeah. Um, they approached him and says, "Oh, we want to make a sequel to Halloween." And I think he very much again, very being very positive, just saying, "Yeah, go ahead, make it, make it your own." I only have one request um, before he agreed to do the soundtrack for it. Is it's just don't hold back, run yeah. with it, make it your own. Don't don't mess about, you know. Which I'm excited to see see the next one and then the next one afterwards to kind of see out yeah. a quadrilogy, which would be really really enjoyable to watch as a a, a quadruple feature. Oh, I, I'm, I'm definitely doing that. <laughs> oh, same here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yeah, that that's basically a, a brief. I say brief. Um, I've just ne- checked the time again. <laughs> Introduction to who we are mm-hmm. and why it is you should listen to our our podcast on horror. <laughs> and I think yeah, I think this is sort of uh, something that we wish to do because we 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 enjoy the genre. Uh, we just love discussing it and then also seeing as to what other people's perspectives and views and opinions are. Yeah. In the genre which we we hold so so dear, uh, and we wish to have fun with it. We we don't want to take it too yeah. seriously and sort of pick it apart to to the nth degree. We just just want to have fun with it. Um, yeah. I wish others to do the we'd same. Love to hear. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we'd love to hear from well folk who do listen. Mm-hmm. Honestly, write in because what we we'd love to set up is a, a discussion. Really, we can discuss things, but we have such similar tastes that we're just going to be like, oh well. 
I love John Carpenter. If if you don't, let me know why. Or mm-hmm. what do you prefer? <laughs> or I mean, you're wrong if you don't like him. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what we, we hope. We, we, we'd love interaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll read them out it, definitely as well. Get your get your buy in as to what we, we discuss because um, we wish to expand our knowledge or understanding of, of the genre which we hold so dear. So um, me personally, yeah. I, I've not really watched that much Yellow. I've heard of anything, I've not watched any. Um, yeah. And then loads of other different genres which are, we would love to delve into. So anything in particular you feel as though we should watch, any homework you wish to give us, by all means, as Matthew says, write in and we'll gladly oblige and we'll watch it and, and yeah. see as to what we, we feel about it. Uh, we would definitely like you to write in. Um, I think the the end game for us is that we do expand our knowledge. Uh, that's the whole point. The, these are all our opinions, so if you do disagree or if you, you think you, you want to hear our opinions on something we've not seen, that's, that's the point of this. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, both you and I are going to have differences of opinion, um, because we, you know, we've 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 watched different things, or we've you know enjoyed different things, maybe you know separate from each other. But I think it's it's that's what we want to get into a little bit more. Um, there's maybe some genre I've watched more than you have, and maybe want to get you to watch it. And we've already given each other homework, um, and that's something we're going to continue to do. But if you wish to give us any homework, by by all means, write in, uh, and we'll gladly listen. We'll gladly watch it, and then we'll give you our sort of honest opinion. Provided it's not too much, obviously we're going to try and do as much as we possibly can. So we'll take this opportunity to thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Tune in next time. Yeah. Yeah. We've been the podcast in the backseat. Thank you again for listening. And until next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye.